it's preparing to stream, so it's about to go live. Probably just a few more seconds here. It's setting up. What's my clue? Um, no. no. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ask a Forester. This is a YouTube live stream as part of our great Minnesota outdoor adventure. Thanks for hanging in here. We had a few technical difficulties, but we're so happy to be joining you today. I am, we will be talking with DNR Forester, Troy Holcomb, Forestry Outreach Specialist, Jen Teagarden, and Brian Schwingle, who is a Forest Health Specialist. I'm Emily Hyams, an Outreach Specialist. Um, just really relying on some questions from you guys coming in, and but I, so I want you to go ahead and submit anything you've got on trees, tree health, woodland management, whatever. We're here to answer your questions. But to give you a moment to start typing, I'm going to do a kind of a pop quiz here and ask my, uh, ask Troy, what is your favorite tree and why do you like it? Well, I'm a forester, so I pretty much like all trees. Um, I'm partial right now to red oak. Um, it makes great lumber. It's uh, great for wildlife in terms of acorns. And uh, I really like the way they look in the fall. Awesome. Um, see, I'm still hoping to get some questions coming, but Brian, how about you? What's your favorite tree? It is not a red oak, Troy. It is a bur oak. I'm a huge fan of bur oak. I think they're I just think they're beautiful um, and they're tough. They're tough trees. Although we're seeing, and maybe we'll get to this, we're seeing um, kind of a statewide decline of mature brooks in throughout the entire state, but mostly in central and southern Minnesota. Okay. Um, Jen, can we go with you? Sure. Well, I'll just go a little bit different from Brian and Troy and I'll say uh, white pine. I love white pine because um, I remember in college at Itasca State Park, I canoed out to an island and with a friend and her and I climbed up to the top of a really tall white pine. And so that's a fond memory, but it also adds green to the landscape in the winter time. Awesome, awesome. Um, as I am seeing there, I'm checking around for questions coming in, but I had some pre-questions that uh, people submitted that I'd love to have you answer. I think that, um, so Brian, you were talking about, you like bur oaks. How about, we know about oak blight. Actually, you and Troy have this in common. You like oaks. Um, should I be planting bur oaks now with everything we're seeing about oak blight and issues with that? Yeah, I think bur oak, is a fantastic species for Minnesota's future. Um, forestry climate scientists have pegged bur oak as a winner for the predicted future climate of Minnesota. And right now we are seeing a lot of, of older bur oaks die in the landscape. But I think that has to do with the fact that we've had just some extreme precipitation events in the last <clears throat> two decades. Um, I know in South Central Minnesota, I think they hit the first, second, and third driest growing seasons in since 1895 in the last couple decades. But they've also had some near record wet seasons. So it's just been really rough on all trees. But bur oaks in particular, they, they can grow on a wide variety of sites than a lot of other trees. They can grow on wetter sites than a lot of other trees and they can grow on, they can grow on um, drier sites than a lot of other trees. Um, but it's a great tree for, this, for the future, I know it is. Okay. Um, so if I was planting something to, to plant in my yard right now, Jen, what would be a good site? Like say if I was in the, the Twin Cities Metro, what would be a good tree? Well, there's a, the one thing I tell people when you're planting tree is plant a variety of trees. So look around your neighborhood and if you see a lot of maples, which is a very common tree in the metro, think about planting something other than maple. 
the DNR has uh, great resources on our website about trees that are gonna do well in the future. And we have a whole list of trees that will do well in the Metro. So one example is hackberry. That's a tree that um, will do well in actually many parts of Minnesota. So I would suggest, again, just looking at what's in your neighborhood and plant something that's different. Okay. When's a good time to plant? You know, uh, the best time to plant is in the fall, actually, though you have a less a lot less variety of trees that you can plant. And usually those trees are containerized trees or bald and burlap. So oftentimes these containerized trees in the fall time will need to have their root systems um, or the root balls usually sawed off, cut into, um, to correct for circling roots. And when, again, we have a great video on our webpage to show that, um, but Springtime is also a time where you can plant trees. You just need to make sure you water them every week if it doesn't rain roughly one inch in the week. That will help your tree survive. If you don't water it, it probably will be dead the next spring. Okay. Um, so uh, you're saying fall is the best time to plant and you mentioned that there's not many um, Oh, never mind. Okay, guys, I got a message in from Kim and I was just stalling to figure out an answer. She says she's not hearing us live. So I am disappointed, but everything we just did, no one saw it. <laughs> Disappointing. Maybe a dress rehearsal? That was a dress rehearsal. I'm reading Good, a I didn't uh, like chat my box. For the Baroque. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. We we did have such luck this morning, and I'm sure Caleb will uh, confirm. When it, everything clicked, it went, and we, we, we've nailed it. We'll just have to do it on YouTube, and we thought we would be all set. Now, I am seeing us live um, coming through, so it does surprise me. Oh, Okay, here's life. I got an, another uh, another answer from somebody and um, they're saying they can hear us. So you know what? We are foresters, we can do this. We're gonna <laughs> just keep going and I'm gonna just figure since we started 10 minutes late, we're gonna start stop at 10 minutes after. Actually, my husband just came to the door to tell me he sees us live. So I don't know why people are not seeing us live, but we are good. And thanks everybody for chiming in. And I tell you what, a few of you who, um, I'm not getting the questions coming through my, uh, my chat box. So if you've got questions, and are able to reach me if uh, our first three folks can do that you can go ahead and pipe in otherwise i'm going to go with the ones that we took in advance of this meeting and we're going to continue on troy i haven't picked on you for a little while so i'm going to double back i know that your specialization is mostly with the woodland owners so if i wanted to have wildlife like i want to increase say the deer population and other hunting aspects in my woods can i plant trees for that yeah, you sure can. And um, the most important first step for doing a project like that is, is to start with a good plan. So um, understand what kind of resources your property has in terms of wetlands and types of trees, um, and vegetation, and then uh, moving, developing a good plan with a forester of what you're going to plant and where and how you're going to prepare the area to plant the trees. So um, habitat isn't just habitat, it, it can be a wide variety of things. Um, and it's really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, it's a question of what you're interested in. Uh, something like a fisher or some species of hawks or owls might like older trees, taller trees with a dense canopy where some species of game like grouse or deer might prefer a younger, denser forest. So okay. um, meeting with a forester on your property getting an understanding of uh, all the resources on your property and then developing a plan um, for how to um, improve or change your habitat is, is the best course of action. Okay. How about the health of my forest? What happens if I start seeing some sort of strangeness? Um, I know that we've had a lot of problem with um, 
some of the spruce issues, et cetera. Brian, do you have some thoughts about if I see something weird going on with my trees, what do, where do I start? Where do I begin? Well, I guess the first thing I'll say is that um, part of a healthy forest is actually dead and dying trees. Um, and of course, some people might take, um, they might not agree with that. You know, so for example, um, somebody who owns a red pine plantation or a spruce plantation, they don't, they probably don't want to see any death in those forests. Um, and that's understandable from their perspective. But, you know, when we're talking about large landscape level forests, um, you need dead trees in there to provide habitats for critters. There's a lot of, you know, I'm not a wildlife specialist, but certainly a large percentage of our wildlife species rely on dead trees for homes. And actually dead trees also um, create habitats which increase the good guys in the world. So like, for example, ants. Ants can be predators of bark beetles. If you have more dead trees, you're going to have more ants. Now, of course, there's like this balance point where too many dead trees is not acceptable. So it's really a subjective call um, on when a uh, a forest is not healthy anymore. It all depends on what the landowner wants for their own woods. But just generally speaking, a few dead trees, totally normal and and good. Okay, so when I'm looking at woodland property and I am sometimes seeing snags, which we call the dead ones, mm -hmm. that's deliberate most of the time. People are leaving those because they're habitat for good things. Right, right. Alrighty. Can I contribute and, on that, Emily? Yes, yeah. please do, Troy. I think it's it's hard. It's a challenge for most people to understand the difference between non-native and native insects and diseases in their woods. Um, there's a lot of insects and diseases that affect our woods that are native. They evolved here along with our trees for the last 10,000 years, and um, they're cyclical. They come and go, and it's just uh, part of the way our woods work. Uh, at the same time, there are some non-native ones that are particularly aggressive, and those are the ones we really need to um, worry about and be aware of. Um, and then I think to get back to your question, what's the best place for someone to start? Um, feel free to just call your DNR forestry office, um, and we'll do the best we can to help you figure out what's going on. Okay. okay. And I'd like to pipe in talk Please about do. a little bit about urban forest. So it is okay to have dead trees in urban forests. You just need to make sure that if it is a dead tree or a declining tree, if you want to look around and say if it failed, meaning tipped over, split apart, is it going to damage anything? Mm -hmm. um, so if it would damage something, that's where you think, well, okay, I probably want to cut down this tree and replace it. But if it's way back in an area that's not going to cause any damage, if it fails, then I would suggest keep it because, again, the wildlife in the urban areas also need dead trees. Okay. Well, we're going to be seeing a lot of dead trees in the metro area. We already are. Jen, maybe you can start with um, what's your thoughts about uh, if, if my tree is infected with emerald ash borer, there's some telltale signs of that. I, I think a lot of people are versed on what those are, but you can go over what the signs are. And then at what point do I make a decision about, you know, what's going to happen to the tree? Sure. Well, usually what you start to see is a little bit of canopy thinning, meaning the tree isn't filling out fully with leaves then what you'll start to see is what's called woodpecker flecking. And so the wood, um, usually emerald ash borer infests close to the top of the canopy. And then as the population grows, it starts to infest further and further down in the tree. And so woodpeckers actually feast on those insects that are underneath the bark. And while they're trying to get to those insects, they start flecking or picking away the bark. And so you'll start seeing usually um, lighter colored bark uh, amongst the darker colored bark. The lighter colored bark is where it had been flecked off. You can treat your tree with a chemical. Um, and we, I suggest always having it done by a professional. The, and if the tree has roughly 50% canop canopy decline, it still could be saved. And so you could treat the tree with this chemical. Um, we 
it's called emimectin benzoate, and it's um, proven that you can inject the tree wa once every other year, and the insects that are actually in the tree will be killed from it. But a tree with more than 50% canopy decline probably has too much damage internally to be able to recover. Now, I always encourage people to think about, look at your tree, is it valuable? Does it provide shade? Is it um, a very large tree that is important to wildlife? Uh, large canopy trees also um, reduce the amount of stormwater that um, enter our uh, storm systems. And so then I say, oh, if it's a valuable tree, I would suggest treating it. If okay. it's not, you want to cut it down now because a tree infested with emerald ash borer, um, if it dies from it, it's a lot more difficult to cut down once it's dead and okay. a lot more expensive. So that's not one I would leave as a snag. I would take those out if they're dead. Yes, those ones okay. you wouldn't want to leave as a snag. I do have a couple of questions coming through from our audience. And one of them is, how big is too big when transplanting white pine? Troy, do you have any thoughts? I haven't heard from you for a minute or two. Well, I think it, it honestly has more to do with, with what you're capable with. Um, I've transplanted um, five, six foot tall white pine saplings. I did it in the fall after they've been done growing uh, for the year. So in the September, that time frame, uh, when they're dormant. And I mean, there's tree companies that use tree spades to transplant trees all the time. Um, it just, it's more or less um, what you're capable of doing. Okay. Um, you wanna try to get as much of the root system as you can of those trees. The more roots you bring with it, the better chance it's going to survive the transplant shock. Does anyone else have anything to add on that? I would say then the following spring, just making sure you water it because when you are transplant it, you're damaging the roots. And so you're damaging the tree's ability to take up water. So again, key to survival of a recently planted tree versus a transplanted tree, again, it's just water, making sure it gets at least 25 gallons of water a week or one inch of rain falling in a week. Okay, another question that came through is the group talked about the wildlife habitat. What are some other reasons that landowners reach out to foresters other than wildlife? Well, it, wildlife is a pretty popular topic of conversation among landowners. Um, sometimes people will call about their forest and, and they're starting to notice that it's getting older, it has more uh, dead or dying trees in it. And they're wondering if there's anything they should do to keep their woods healthy. The answer could be um, a well-planned timber harvest to kind of remove the old trees before they blow down and allow new trees to grow. Um, there's also some tax incentive programs available to forest landowners in Minnesota. Um, so many people that want to take advantage of those tax incentive programs will start off by having a forest stewardship plan written for their property which is a, a comprehensive plan written by an approved forester that um, gives a good resource inventory of, uh, of their property and then some recommendations for things that a landowner can do to accomplish their goals. Did I answer your question, Emily? Yeah. And I was gonna pipe in, in urban settings, uh, I usually encourage people for small trees, it's okay to trim them as long as you know how to trim them properly. But once trees start to get larger, uh, if you don't prune them correctly, you're opening up very large wounds that can um, easily become, uh, start to decay and lead to decay within the tree. So I always encourage people, you know, contact a certified arborist or a professional tree trimmer to have your trees trimmed. And, you know, there are other things that they could do is inspect it to make sure, for example, sometimes trees start to split um, where two branches um, come together. And again, there's ways to keep that tree from failing and using cabling or other um, techniques that this arborist would use. Um, so I, that's why I um, often encourage people to contact foresters in that way. Okay, another question from our audience is, 
Um, regarding transplanting trees in the fall, one question is, is it too late to, to be planting trees in October? And added on that is, is it recommended to mulch to help protect the roots? I've um, heard of uh, some research being done at the University of Minnesota and they planted trees up, up until the ground froze. So as long as you can dig the hole, you can get the tree in there. I also always encourage plant, um, putting mulch around the tree, um, at least around the root system, and because that's going to protect the tree. It's gonna, it acts like an insulator in the winter to keep the roots from freezing, and then in the summer, it keeps the soil wet, wetter and cool, and as, it, as the mulch breaks down, it releases nutrients. But the key for mulch is to not let the mulch touch the trunk of the tree. Because if the mulch can touch the trunk of the tree, it's going to start rotting the trunk of the tree. So the, there's a rule called the 333 mulch rule, three inches deep of mulch, three foot wide around a newly transplanted tree, and three inches from the trunk. Okay. That's a kind of convenience that it's all threes. Um, so I have a question about spruce dying back. Um, so why are spruce, why is my spruce dying? Sounds like a good question for Brian. I think, I don't know, Troy and Jennifer, but I would bet that that is the most common question DNR Forestry gets. Um, I tell everyone this, so I'm sorry if any listeners out there have heard me say this, but if I was the environmental czar in Minnesota, I would make it illegal to plant a white spruce next to another white spruce. It's inevitable that when you plant a white spruce next to a white spruce, uh, so black, a lot of people um, might be familiar with black hill spruce. That's a variety of white spruce. If you plant black hill spruce next to black hill spruce, a row or white spruce, it's inevitable that they're going to get diseased. Um, there, there are a couple um, needle diseases that um, eventually start developing primarily in the lower canopy and the inner canopy on spruce. The closer spruce are together, the better the environment to promote that disease. The other thing is that these disease agents, they're fungi, they actually grow in spruce needles that are healthy and they don't start causing disease until the tree is stressed. So when a spruce branch becomes shaded, it becomes stressed. And then the wet conditions um, in the spring and summer promote kind of the sporulation or the creation of spores on those needles and then the spread of those. So it's inevitable. Um, so I, I recommend not planting spruce next to other spruce. If you have some, some rows of spruce or even a spruce plantation and it's starting, you're really starting to lose the lower canopy, I'd start thinning those out. Okay. Re so taking out space. the sickest ones, right. give them space. Yep. Yeah, I see a tendency as well among um, both landowners and, and homeowners that uh, want to use a, a Colorado blue spruce or a Black Hill spruce to a, establish a line of shrubs. And they're not shrubs, they're trees, they need a lot of space. And you need to consider how much space they're going to need as they grow older, not how much space they need now. And uh, I've done a lot of site visits with. Um, bunch of spruce planted six feet apart underneath the canopy of some maples and oaks and about 10 to 15 years later um, as Brian said those trees get stressed out because there's not enough sun anymore and then you start to see these um, fungi um, have their effect on the trees. Okay. The best, well, we've, the best setting for a the best setting for a spruce not by any other tree and in full sun then good. they'll do good. Good. I was just going to say we're coming down to the last few minutes, so we probably only have time to take one more question. Um, we got a little bit of a late start, so I am running. Uh, uh, I'm going to run over our planned one o'clock quit time till we will go to about uh, six or seven minutes past. Um, and so basically, what I wanted to ask was one of the audience is asking about how can you tell if your oak tree has B-O-B versus oak wilt. So that's um, bur oak blight. Is that what it is? Or versus oak wilt. How can you tell the difference? Bur oak blight. The main difference is um, 
if your bur oak is developing brown leaves in the lower canopy, kind of starting in the later summer, that's bur oak blight. If your bur oak is dying back pretty quickly, starting in June or July, if from the edge of the canopy, and, the, and it's dropping a lot of leaves like in June, July, that's probably oak wilt. Um, it gets very tricky this time of year to distinguish between bur oak blight and oak wilt. Very tricky in some situations. And there are a couple other problems too that, that confuse people. And so this time of year, actually mid-August, September, I really recommend collecting a symptomatic branch and submitting that to the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic. That is the most sure way to get a solid diagnosis. Okay. And make sure the branch is live, not dead. Good call. Oh, yes. Good point. Good point. I wouldn't have known. Um, that is pretty much where we were. Um, we have to wrap. And we have such good information. And I know we could do this forever. And um, I want to encourage people. We can post the uh, the um, contact information for our information center. And you can, audience, I, you can ask these questions of the DNR. They'll get routed to the appropriate expert for an answer. That's what we're here for. Um, so I want to thank the audience for bearing with us with these little technical difficulties and the hiccup at the beginning. And also, I especially want to thank uh, Brian Schwingel, Troy Holcomb, and Jennifer Teagarden for joining me for bringing in all these great answers. Thanks, everybody. Have a great well, day. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to let me talk about trees. <laughs> Good.